At the age of 17, Juz Kitson joined the National Academy of Arts to study ceramics, graduating with first class honours in 2009. It was when she was completing her honours that David Walsh visited her studio unexpectedly and acquired a collection from Mona, the Museum of Old and New Art in Tasmania. From there, the world really was her oyster. Juz spent many years travelling, following the work as a professional artist throughout Indonesia, India, and established her own studio in Jingdezhen, China, the porcelain capital of the world in 2012. It was here Juz could further refine her craft as a sculptor, working alongside artisans and learning techniques that just weren't available to her in Australia, the results of which are here for us to admire tonight. Juz's work has been described in many ways, including luscious and audacious, visceral, quietly seductive, provocative, parasitic, grotesque, beautiful and delicate. Hybrids of nature teetering between the human and animal conditions. It's this varying human response that Jazz enjoys as part of her creative process. Meticulous and detailed, Jazz is not afraid to push the boundaries. Her work often involves collecting reclaimed animal pelts, husks and tusks, and strange and exquisite forms from the landscape, manipulating and reinventing them into awe-inspiring art. While working in China over the eight year period, Jazz dreamt up of the creation of a permanent studio and home back in Australia. So the idea of the Art House Milton was born. It is here that Jazz runs popular live workshops and offers intensive internships. Jazz continues to exhibit extensively in both solo and group exhibitions throughout Australia, China, United Kingdom, Dubai, Singapore and Japan. Some of these exhibitions include the Museum of Contemporary Arts Primavera in 2013, Art Dubai 2014, and the Adelaide Biennial 2016. Juz has been the finalist in numerous major prizes, including the Sydney Meyer Fund Australian Ceramic Award in 2019, the Alice Prize in 2018, and the Wynn Prize in 2017. Jazz's work is held in many public collections, including the Gallery of South Australia's Art Bank and RMIT University, as well as private collections in Australia, Germany and the UK. It's an absolute honour to talk to Jazz tonight and get an insight into how she balances work and life, her process, and of course, we welcome you to ask all your questions as well. Please join me in welcoming Jazz Kitson. G'day. Hi, and <laughs> How are you going? How are things in New South Wales? Wait, firstly, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you for spending the time putting that together. Yeah, yeah that was beautiful. <laughs> well, that's, um, that's our pleasure. My husband and I work on that together and he does the techie stuff and I just have to write. But there's been so many beautiful write-ups about your work and, oh, yeah, all you need to do is Google your name and it's, like, overwhelming. It's like, wow, you are an accomplished artist. Amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. It's a real pleasure to talk to you live tonight and I really appreciate the time that it takes. Um, and everyone that's watching, um, please, if you've got questions for Judge, she's really open and fantastic to talk to. So, yeah, shoot your questions in the comments section and we'll, we'll certainly... Um, try and get to them all um we've got people with us so don't worry i always go oh is it working? <laughs> <laughs> so you certainly do hi andrea we've got susan from new zealand hi susan <clears throat> oh the gorgeous cass i was just talking about you cass how are you lovey she says <laughs> i have a friday off i'd like to differ that <laughs> <laughs> she's got students to look after now um bernadette daly hi b how are you going she's from the uk as well oh, Vicky Miller. Fantastic, Rita. Yeah, yeah. So we, we are going to have probably a lot of fibre and mixed media artists join mm -hmm. us because that's our main audience. But I really yeah. wanted to challenge everybody and just open everyone's eyes to the world of sculpture a little bit more. And of certainly, you're you're you put tech, um, textiles and um, you know found objects within your work which a lot of textile artists do as well so I feel like everything we're going to talk to tonight is going to have that um, you know how we were saying that cross-pollination mm, absolutely yeah. 
Mm. Yeah. So, so guys, feel free to ask any questions at all. I mean, we can talk about ceramics, but of course, process is such a wonderful thing and, and, and correlates across so many different um, genres of art. Mm. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Without process, there's not much else is there. I've, I'm learning. Mm. I think so, well, especially, you know, and, and I guess in being in, in this sort of situation that we all find ourselves in, lockdown, <laughs> uh, there's so many different processes. You know, recently I was thinking, hmm, crochet, you know, that's something that I've never dabbled with. And I think, um, you know, it's just opening up different avenues of, of making with your hands. Mm -hmm. so that's um, something that I've certainly always been attracted to, is yeah. the, the idea of the hand formed. Um, and seeing the artist touch, you know, and I think that's something that we all share in common, you know, and I'm excited to, to share some information about my practice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Where would you like to start? I mean, I've kind of got a running order of like, you know, art school and then to travelling and I'm kind of working chronologically, but I'm happy to start wherever you want. <laughs> oh, and ask away. <laughs> I was really intrigued by art school. We, over the, over the time of doing Fibre Arts Take Two and we have a little Facebook community, I see quite often that people say, I'm not a serious artist because I haven't been to art school or mm -hmm. I'm not formally trained or, you know, I, what what's your, like having only ever known art as a profession mm -hmm. and going through what people may describe as like this dream, it feels like this dream, like art school, Mona, travelling, massive galleries, international exhibitions. It just seems like this dream ride, and I'm sure that it's not always smooth. <laughs> but what, what, what advice would you give to someone who's, who's maybe doubting themselves as an artist because they haven't been to art school? Maybe that's the question. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think uh, per se it's the certificate, uh, the, you know, the actual academic side, but it's the environment. And I think art school had a profound effect uh, personally for me. And given that transition of going from, from high school and, you know, I sort of had a, I guess, you know, there's exceptions um, within the creative worlds of people perhaps knowing at an early age that they want to pursue a career in the arts. So for me personally, I was definitely one of those uh, people that was, you know, very, I came from a, quite a commercial um, sort of conservative background and, you know, my family and, and parents wanting to uh, to see me go into business or, um, you know, have a, a sort of, oh, hang on a second, I'm just going to let my, my dog in. I've got a six point in Jazz has got a little puppy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you, you need to put, maybe you need to put the puppy in. live. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so for me, it was, it was a pretty significant thing to go to art school and, and get that accreditation and really pursue the sort of academic side, but also having a really strong foundation in studio practice. Um, that was something that for me, I felt that, if I wanted to make it as an artist, I wanted to be around fellow artists and creatives and like-minded people. So yeah. I wouldn't say it was actually, I don't think I've ever used the certificate. I don't think I, you know, I probably received it on the day of the ceremony and that's it. I've never seen it ever again. But for me, it was really being surrounded by other creative, like-minded peers and you know, forming those networks at such an early foundational period for all of us that now, you know, almost a decade later where, um, you know, we've all gone on to lead different um, creative lives, you know, in some form. But I think definitely it's, I guess, just which avenue people want to take. For me personally, I do teach a little bit as well. So I felt that having that really strong art theory uh, basis behind my practice was sort of integral and very important. But I think for some people, you know, they're more uh, makers and, you know, studio potters or production potters. And uh, so for them, it's more about actually going out there and making the work and uh, having the exhibitions and uh, creating those platforms to exhibit. And I think that, you know, even as a mature student, and I saw that at the National Art School where I, where I went, where I studied, and uh, it was incredible to be surrounded by school leavers, people straight out of high school, but then also uh, mature age students and such a diverse range of different people coming from all walks of life. And for me, 
Uh, I think that was probably what I walked away from uh, that was, you know, the most important part of going to art school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you always know that you would be like a commercial artist? Like, did you, that was, was that in your core? It's interesting. I think I always knew that I wanted to be able to survive as an artist. That was always yeah. something incredibly important. And I knew that if I had to, to survive, if I wanted to pay my bills and, and do all those wonderful things that everybody else does, you know, p p you know potentially purchase a home and, um, you know, and do all those great things, then I thought, well, I need to have the sort of juxtaposed of commercial work, but then also, um, you know, the ability to, to have saleable, ex accessible work that potentially would then fund the larger, more experimental uh, curatorial projects or museum um, projects, for example, the Adelaide Biennial, uh, things that, you know, often I'll have to ask for, um, you know, put forward proposals, asking for, for funds uh, in different avenues to be able to produce these really large scale, um, you know, experimental works that perhaps, you know, for example, uh, an installation in um, Adelaide Biennial that was six metres suspended from the ceiling, no, that's not exactly very accessible to a domestic uh, commercialised art market within Australia. But for me, it's something that that is the joy and the excitement and the constant that keeps me doing what I what I do, you know. And, and I think making work both accessible to a general market is something that I've, I guess, considered perhaps in the last few years. And I think... Um, you know, I'm now in my early 30s, and I think that's probably more of a sensible outlook, whereas 10 years ago in my early 20s, perhaps I, I wasn't thinking about the commerciality of certain works. So I think it's, it's very much sort of chapters of your life and, um, you know, different stages and, and I guess yeah. where, you, where you personally want to place the work. You know, often we all have dreams and aspirations and um, you know, to get there, there's certain things that, that we have to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love that how you speak about it, it sort of changes and, and it's part of that human condition as well is that responsibility to be able to, you know, feed ourselves, how to house ourselves. But then you start thinking like, I'll show my age here, but you start thinking about retirement and going, okay, well, I really, you know, and that was, that was going to be one of my questions, actually, about the physicality of the work and the longevity of the work that you do. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, actually, that we, yeah, I, often I have this conversation, um, you know, with others that I work with because for those that are familiar with ceramics, it's quite a taxing um, physical, you know, it's, it's quite labour-intensive, packing gas kilns, shelves are heavy, um, you know, it can often be sort of back-breaking work depending on, on the, the scale of what you're making. So I think often, you know, there's times, and, and not only that, you know, the sort of labour intensive physicality, it's also the materials being toxic. You know, there's so many different uh, glaze materials and, um, you know, silica within the clay bodies and, and things that I often think, wow, like for me, you know, in terms of sort of health, <laughs> you know, on a, on a long term, I think yeah. the implications of that. Um, but, you know, it's when you're in that moment, you know, in the studio and, you know, I think of superannuation, what, that, that word doesn't exist, you know, for so many creatives, unfortunately, yeah. but I'd like to think that, you know, I'll be creating my best work, um, you know, in my 60s and 70s, you know. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, I think there's certainly hope. And Bernadette mm. says, um, I'm so pleased you said mature student. I've continued to study until my 50s, both academic and workshops. Yeah. You never stop. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. And I, you know, I'd love to, to be able to start you know, doing some couture dressmaking, you know, in my 50s or even, oh, yeah. you, know, you know, a different course or, you know, absolutely. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. I um, was very interested in, like, the response to your work and I and I um, was working on your images today for your slideshow and my, my son came in, Oliver, and I said, Ollie, Ollie, come and have a look. Come and have a look at this artwork. Tell me what you think of it. And he goes, oh, oh, okay. And I go, well, no, give me some words. And, you know, because I was like, I just I just was really interested to know what a 12-year-old thought of what he was looking at. Mm. Um, and can I show you the image that he was looking <laughs> at? I'd love to share with you his response. And was this the, <laughs> was this the Adelaide biennial, biennial piece? 
No, so actually this was uh, 2013 Primavera at the oh, we are in Sydney. Yeah. Well, it's absolutely amazing. And would you like to know what his response was? Oh, yes, please. He said, this is from a 12-year-old boy, everybody. I feel like I'm being watched by brains. <laughs> <laughs> Hairy brains. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And I thought, wow. That's fantastic. And then I showed him some of your beautiful work that's currently with um, your exhibition at the moment with Dominic Mersch Gallery. Mm -hmm. and, and just the reason why I brought this up now was because it goes, it's like a vase has a beautiful dress. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. You know, that's, that's actually really interesting because when, when I started making these urns and this, was a, this is a new sort of direction that my work um, took sort of quite spontaneously over the last 18 months and really it was due to I guess COVID and not having access to my studio and all of a sudden you know not having a, a kiln in Australia and sort of forced into this weird limbo space of thinking okay if I want to actually pursue uh, working with porcelain and high high firing high fired uh, mm -hmm. ceramics I'll need to to invest and so it was really wanting to push um, working on a large scale and hand building, uh, but also taking, you know, the, the sort of uh, traditional vessel form that holds such a strong connotation for being a domesticated object, um, mm. but essentially reinventing it. So, you know, for me, I've worked for, for 10 years, um, essentially resisting the, the plinth and uh, the wheel and, and anything functional. And for me, it was... Um, you know, really wanting to take the that the sort of you know the strong image of this vessel, uh, the urn, which uh, was also a sort of uh, lament for the wildfires that happened on the south coast where my studio is. So I'm currently based in Milton. Uh, so the, the you know I decided to create a series of of urns for a lament for the the wildfires and referencing the direct. Um, landscape in these these parts close to my studio but it was interesting that all of a sudden I'm making these urns and you know they're funerary urns it's always been you know this sort of similar thread that runs through my work of, of Eros and Thanatos life and death uh, so it was definitely um, you know rather fitting that I would create urns you know if I was going to make something functional non-functional but all of a sudden, I, I felt like they started to take a life, take on a life of their own. And, you know, all of a sudden it was, okay, maybe they're not urns. They're almost uh, beings. And I had a, a few assistants working for me um, in the lead up to this current exhibition. And often they would come in and, you know, sort of delicately dance between them um, as they were drying. And one of the girls said, oh, you know, they, they have such a presence in the studio. You know, they really are these sort of beings. Um, mm. Yeah, and I thought that was interesting because as I started making them, you know, I all of a sudden I was influenced and in looking at uh, Bjork. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely obsessed with music and I'm constantly uh, listening to music in the studio and delving into, you know, all sorts of world, um, worldly acts. And, you know, at, at one point I thought, oh, I would love to make a headdress or, um, you know, I was looking at um, Van Herpen, who's a, a couture dressmaker, uh, and a lot of uh, different dresses. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. It's sort of oozing into the works uh, where yeah. they all are sort of adorned by these, um, you know, they're almost like bridesmaids sort of dresses that, so yeah, it's fascinating how, you know, works take on a life of their own, I think during the, the process as well. They're absolutely uh, stunning. And yes, I can, I can see the Bjork. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, Susan Peppers asked how big they are, and I've got this image here which kind of gives yeah, a little bit of scale. So um, that's also a new, a new series of works. Um, so that's an entirely different way of making. The urns are actually fired, made in one sitting, essentially. Um, so with a lot of my work, I actually bounce between several projects. And for me, it was the first time actually sitting and just making a porcelain or ceramic object um, in three or four days straight, rather than 
working in multiple hundreds of different components and then firing and then constructing after firing, um, which is how I've worked essentially for the last decade. And so this is really quite a sort of pivotal moment within my practice and sort of pushing the work in a new direction because for me to be able to create a single object out of porcelain, in the past I was only able to, to build sort of, um, you know, about 20 centimetres by 20 centimetres where as now with these larger urns, you're looking at about 90 centimetres height. Um, so, yeah, they're quite big. They take about, there's, it's usually about three people to move one. Wow. Yeah. That was going yeah. to be one of my questions as well, Jazz, was how do you, like I've seen photos on your Instagram, which is gorgeous too, by the way. Daniel will pop a link up to your Instagram for people to follow. But, uh, I mean, two questions here. Yes. Do you get nervous when you're moving them? Have you ever broken them? And have and this is three questions. And have you ever had any, like, kiln explosions? Like I've never worked with a kiln before. Um, yeah. But I have heard that there can be, if there's a real, I mean, there's masters in China, as you know, that just yeah. dedicate their life to these these kilns. And yeah. have you had have you had explosions? Oh gosh, all all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> so explosions first. I um obviously I, I purchased a, a new kiln. Um, brand new kilns in Australia don't come with instructions. Nice. <laughs> so that is um an incredible because they they make them uh, custom built for, for each customer. So that was definitely a challenge. Um, you know, it's a lot of trial and error. So not only was I creating these large vessels, um, you know, it was a bit of a gamble. And I think most people probably would have said I was mad, uh, but I was spending two or three weeks on one single sculpture and then firing it and it was exploding. Um, so yeah, it was pretty, pretty harrowing uh, to go through that. That was about August, uh, September last year. And it was essentially about four months of, um, yeah, things slumping, cracking, crazing, um, and, you know, fortunately only one uh, mass casualty. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, um, I think, you know, it's, it's the nature of working with ceramics. And I feel that, you know, there's a sense of you have to be a masochist. I think at least just a little bit, you know, the ability to be able to experience pain and, and keep coming back, um, yeah. you know, and it's the, it's the results. It's, you know, whether it's a high gloss glaze or, um, you know, it's the, the perfections and the imperfections in, in, in particular forms that, um, you know, often, I guess, speaking, you know, on a, on a ceramic level, often, um, I find probably 90% of the time I'm not actually happy when I open the kiln. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. And I think it, you know, it takes yeah. time. It takes a few days to pull out the pieces and really observe the glazes. And I think that yeah. um, a lot of ceramicists would probably agree with me there that, um, you know, it's such a, a process and such a lengthy, um, you know, practice to have that there's so many different avenues to take, but, I think with gas, gas firings, especially, you know, when you're playing with fire, sometimes you, you get burnt. <laughs> yeah, I love that analogy. That's gorgeous. Yeah, <laughs> nerve-wracking stuff. I, oh, I didn't get a chance to go and check what the kiln was in our garage because um, I think I've mentioned it before live, but, um, yeah, we inherited a, a kiln when we started living in this house. <laughs> so um, yeah. you totally inspired me to go and you figure out what it is. I've always been nervous about it, though, I like just because it's that unknown and... Um, Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I think you're pretty safe with an electric kiln, essentially yeah. set and forget programming. Um, yeah. But with a gas kiln, gas, you, you have to, to nurture it, babysit and, um, and sit by it. And I think, you know, there's a beauty with that as well. Um, you know, essentially they, you know, I'm not sure whether you've heard this, but you, every time, you know, we pray to the, the kiln goddess. <laughs> every time we go to the kiln. So, um, yeah, it's always interesting what um what yeah. results are, are there yeah b i've seen your question about the installation we're going to show a video of actually about how jazz installs her pieces that are individual components so um if you can hang around and watch that that'd be great but before we get there i wanted to go 
because we're talking about kilns, I was doing a bit of research on, um, now I have to apologise, my, ch- my Mandarin's not great, as you heard. In, um, <laughs> and you did your best to teach me. <laughs> Jing Dijen. Jing Dijen. Um, but there's some amazing YouTube videos out there on this, this capital of the like porcelain capital of the world and basically why China is called China is because of Jing Dijen, meaning China porcelain capital city of the world. Amazing. And these kiln masters and these old ancient kilns. When you were living there, did you get a chance to, obvious, a stupid question probably, but did you explore these places? Oh, of course. You know, I, yeah. I, I lived pretty much eight months of the year in, in China and um, and the rest of the, the time in Australia. So for me, you know, I invested a lot um, mm. working over there. So it was not only working with particular master artisans and sort of outsourcing and learning, you know, this sort of age old craft, whether it was plaster make, mold making or, um, you know, working on a lay or, uh, you know, so many different ways of making, um, glaze recipes, you know, all sorts of, um, you know, that's my studio just there. Yeah. Um, so I, I held that space for nine years, which was pretty amazing and, and something that I kind of, you know, it almost feels quite dreamlike now. <laughs> um, but it was certainly something that, you know, I sort of, um, I went out after graduating from the National Art School in search of working with the most exquisite porcelain. And, uh, you know, it wasn't soon after that I found myself in China. And I, um, I knew that I would eventually, after even just spending the first five weeks, I actually went over, um, I got a, a wonderful grant through Arts New South Wales and ended up doing a, an internship with a, a Beijing artist called Lin Tian Miao. Um, and so, you know, that connection of being a, an intern to she had lived in New York and she was quite sort of internationally renowned um, and, and to work with her. And then she was the one that had suggested I go and work in Jing Jiang. So that was really interesting that I think if I hadn't, you know, it's all these sorts of domino um, affected opportunities that pop up. But um, before that residency and the opportunity to work with Lin Tian Miao, I really had had never desired there was no desire to work in China or uh, prior to that I had, I had an interest in working in Asia and the customs and culture and uh, had spent a lot of time in Indonesia but for me it was as soon as I spent time in Pindajang and I, I became friends with the locals and uh, formed really strong working relationships um, with a lot of the the masters there as well it yeah, inevitably, I would call it home. Yeah. After having spoken to you last night and getting familiar, a little bit more familiar with your work, and then doing a bit of YouTube searching this afternoon on Jing De Zhen, I can just see you there. I could just go, <laughs> oh, yeah. Like it just makes perfect mm. sense. And it just, this, this ancient city and oh, mm. what it's a dream. Amazing. I think what was so exciting about working in the city was just how eclectic and diverse it is. It attracts so many different. Um, international artists, whether they're um, hobbyists, potters, production studios, conceptual artists, um, you know, large scale outdoor site specific um, sculptors, you know, there was uh, such a vast array of people um, and a really strong sense of community. And I think that's interesting when a material brings people together. Um, you know, we're all there because of the, you know, the Kalen. The porcelain. Um, yes. it's, a, it's a pretty amazing, amazing place. And yeah, hope, hopefully things will open up and be able to get back there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How has your work changed since being, oh, I don't want to say stuck in Australia, but being quite sedentary here? So my understanding was that you'd, you'd do some of the process in China that you could do there and then would you bring the work home to Australia, finish it off here or? Yeah, so I feel like... Um, you know, we're all sort of living in this kind of pre pre and post COVID. <laughs> so I'll say, you know, pre COVID, my work was, in, and still is incredibly ambitious. And, you know, I was making large scale installations that perhaps in one suspended work, it could have a thousand components. And, and those components could be slip casted or hand built, um, you know, using mixed media, different 
uh, reclaimed animal pelts, for example. So this was a, a work, Something Sacred. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was the first of the suspended installations that I uh, ended up pursuing and uh, was also exhibited at the Adelaide Biennial. And this actually had 1,100 components and each one is individually hand-formed. And whether it has, you can see the hair, horse hair hanging down. Mm -hmm. For example, with a piece like that, um, the, the porcelain is dipped into wax and then I would melt a needle over a tea light candle and melt a hole into the wax and then insert horsehair strand by strand, one after one after one. And wow. that was similar to the piece that you showed me, uh, that you showed before that your son um, commented about. <laughs> yes. Yeah. With this work, um, every single strand of hair, it's, it's difficult to see it. Um, wow. This strand about four meters in height and each object has about 150 individual strands of horsehair individually melted into the wax surface. So essentially it's not, it's, it's incredibly ephemeral, um, mm. you know, it's over time. Uh, it's exhibited and constructed as one entire installation, but uh, each object is actually numbered to correspond with the screw. So they're all individual pieces that come apart um, that, yeah, there we are. That's a good, good example. So each work, <laughs> um, each work comes with a template. So essentially you, if you were to purchase a work, a wall-based installation, you would, um, receive a template, apply the template on the wall. Um, and then you can see on the right, there's a timber structure, uh, ever so vaguely, you can see that, uh, yeah. just in the center. Uh, with screws inside it, and so that so and each that one might work too. Yeah. yeah, each individual object um, hangs on to every screw, um, which the screw is permanently fixed onto the structure. So essentially, it's Jazz IKEA. I think that's probably a good way to. <laughs> <laughs> um, they they come with a template, and it means that they can be dismantled and reinstalled uh, exactly the way, uh, and it's just a safer way, I guess, of transporting porcelain, but it was also, uh, you know, a natural progression within my practice to be able to push the work and, and exhibit larger scale installations, which yeah. porcelain um, is rather difficult to build to a certain scale. Um, wow. So that's why I think I was more inclined. And working in China, I was making all these individual slip caster objects. You know, I was slip casting multiples um, there you can see durian, so I'd cast, uh, I'd make a 12-piece mold of a, of a durian, um, husks and tusks that I'd collect at different antique markets or, um, you know, I'd collect things across Australia, I'd take it to China, make molds of it, and then I'd ship the, the objects back uh, to Australia. So I think, you know, there's, uh, for me, it's probably the production the, the ability to really produce large scale works. Um, so I think working in Australia now, I'm noticing that it's just me and the studio. I'm at home. It's a quiet space. It's a, it's a sanctuary. Um, you know, my studio is in the backyard. I'm surrounded by my garden. I've got my dogs. I've got the beach five minutes away. You know, I'm, I'm living in rural New South Wales. Um, it's quiet. I, I live in a small town. So for me, it was always that polar opposite of living in the hustle and bustle and the craziness that is um, China. You know, essentially, it's, it's the wild east. Um, you know, juxtaposed against, um, you know, the sort of meditative, um, quiet and calm of the Australian landscape. And I think both have definitely fed um, into my work over the years, uh, which is, you know, that's definitely evident. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Claire's, Claire's impressed. I think everybody that's watching is is super impressed. Oh, thank you. Just for our beautiful friend Vicky, and I've got, I've got that image that I can show actually, are the horns and things found objects or created from porcelain? Yeah, so the horns, there's there's all different stories with the horns and, you know, that's a very long conversation, so I'll keep it really brief. But often on my travels, whether it was through the Australian landscape, I 
spent a lot of time growing up in Tipperborough. Um, oh, yeah, I know Tipperborough. Yeah, if anyone's familiar with that. So obviously yeah. spent a lot of time on the land and yeah. um, you know, surround it. When, when you spend time on a farm, you, you, know, you experience a lot, of, a lot of life, but unfortunately a lot of death as well. And often I'd collect a lot of the, the tusks or bones or skulls. And, um, and for me, it was, it was this idea of wanting to take a, a dead inanimate object and give it new life. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, essentially whether it was using the original object. Um, at the beginning, my work was quite crude, so it was very unresolved. And I was taking, um, you know, whether it was a horse skull or um, kangaroo skull, and I was dipping it into wax and then working onto the surface that way. But then slowly I started to make, um, you know, become more versed in plaster mold making. So I'd, I'd start to make molds of them. And then I realized that, okay, as I was traveling, you know, to different parts of across the country or across the world, I was collecting different things, whether it was from an antique market, um, mm. you know, tusks or tusks there, um, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, so many different places, but I realized that I couldn't bring them obviously back to Australia. So how was I um, going to, yeah. so I take everything to China, make molds of them uh, and then bring them back that way. But often, for example, I spent time uh, in an autonomous region called um, like oh, Guangzhou, which is sort of the far west almost yeah. of China, yeah. uh, with the Longhorn Miao women who wear these most incredible headdresses uh, made out of ancestral hair, and they have a timber horn inside, uh, but they often carve them off a uh, an original so these women were gifting me with these horns so I thought okay how, oh, wow. how can I actually use them uh, in the work themselves so if you go back to that image of the with the Tibetan gazelle horns um, yeah so you can see that on the right uh, they are Tibetan gazelle horns so that's the original uh, dipped in wax to sort of preserve, preserve it and give it a almost satin um, you know skin like finish Mm. And then on the left there, um, most of the, the shiny sort of porcelain surfaces, they're all uh, replicas. Mm. Absolutely beautiful. And the one central, like the lighter coloured sculpture with the bands going across it, you were saying that that's bamboo? So that's actually bamboo root. Yeah, so it's ah. been petrified. And it's got like a really thick uh, layer of resin over the top of it. But, and even just above that, if you see where the white little tip is, mm. and above that there's a, a cluster, um, there are actually teeth. Oh, wow. Teeth, you know, whether it was... So for a lot of a lot of the works that I've, um, you know, been making over the past sort of five years, I'd say, a lot of reclaiming, reusing, upcycling. Um, there was a, a work recently that I made um, it was titled The Future is Your Ocean Oyster and it's a, a glass installation. And the fur from that, a, a rabbit fur, it was actually a reclaimed Lisa Ho vintage jacket. Oh, wow. Is it this one yeah. here? Yeah, that's it. That's the one. Oh, yes. And that was, that was a, a, an installation that I made in lockdown actually last year. Uh, it was about March. And using the glass, I... Uh, worked with a, a master artisan in Indonesia to make these large bulbous uh, glass blown forms um, and then the sp sort of spindle like forms as well and then encapsulate them uh, with the fur but I thought it was yeah such a sort of ironic piece at the time you know for me it, I was trying to make a piece that looked like COVID under a microscopic um, no. <laughs> to, and to me that's what I came up with. <laughs> Fantastic. Is that the piece that we have the video of you installing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'd love to show people that. So I'm going to click on this video and we're going to see Jazz installing that piece.
That was cool. That was cool. Nerve wracking. Yeah. I get nervous watching yeah. that. <laughs> oh, they are incredibly. I think glass is incredible, um, but it is beyond the fragility um, of mm. working with that material. I think is yeah, it's beyond porcelain. But I, I sort of love the relationship that that the two mediums have. Um, yeah. I, I sort of. I think it's definitely it's something new, um, relatively new within my practice, but something I'd love to pursue. Mm. Yeah. Well, fantastic. We've got a few questions. Do you mind me asking? No, yeah. yeah, for sure. So the beautiful Kaz asks, fascinated, yeah, have you ever visited the fine makers in Kyoto, Japan, or have a desire to? Isn't that funny? I um, After spending nine years in China, sort of mid-2019, and I said to myself, it's I'm, t- it's I'm ready. I'm ready to go to Japan. I felt that I needed to spend the time and really devote my energy into working in, in Jingdezhang. Um, there was so much to explore and still I feel like I'm, after nine years I only just scratched the surface. So there was always, you know, we all have that, you know, inclination of, of what's next and uh, it certainly was on the list. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately I didn't, I didn't get there just yet. Yeah. That's fantastic. I know Kaz has been to Japan and studied um, paper making there, and um, yeah, she did a fra- uh, yeah a scholarship there. So amazing. Um, Rita Summers, I find the process of making art is as satisfying and as important as the finished artwork. Does this approach apply to your arts practice, or is making a means to an end? Yeah, isn't it interesting? I um. I actually had this conversation recently with um, a friend of mine and often it's the process, to be honest. I feel like I will get to an exhibition and I'll be at the opening of my own show and I look at the work and there's a certain disconnection to it and I feel like, yeah, I'm not done with that. And I, I feel like it's not even finished, even though it's on the wall and it's being exhibited and perhaps it's being sold and it's going on to, to its forever home. I, I have this slightly unsettled feeling that it's, it's just not finished yet. And I think for me, it's so much is about process that often I think even with Instagram, how lucky we are that, you know, we have that platform of this sort of instant little snapshots of your daily uh, studio practices and and how fascinating that is you know often mixing up a, a tub of glaze or slip and uh, you know the beautiful when clay starts to dry you know for example mm. and crackles, crackles off your skin and you know taking a, a close microscopic uh, photo of something like that you know just those sort of textures and um, you know delicious things that you know the happy accidents the spills the uh, you know, those quiet moments in the studio, I think, um, you know, often when it, when I come to the end, it's like, oh, you know, it's, all right, can we just rewind and just do that little section again? <laughs> Obviously not, not all the logistics, don't want to do the logistics, don't want to do all the, the admin, but, um, yeah, definitely I think the, the process is such a, uh, an amazing part of the. Yeah. the Talk to me about the conceptualizing of an idea so Mm -hmm. you have like do you have an idea in your mind sketch it out you know do some uh mock-ups you know Mm -hmm. i've been lucky enough to do some lovely work it's dirty work um Mm -hmm. a a beautiful sculptor and she doesn't like being called a mosaic artist but a gorgeous sculptor called deb Deb halperin okay she's got work all over the world as well she's amazing um but she makes these foam molds and she sticks them on chopsticks and, you know, skewers and and then she scales them up and they're sitting around her, this big glass house studio. It's amazing. And so, you, but then when you see them in real life, they're like gigantic and they're spinning next to the freeways in Sydney. Yeah. And, yeah it's like incredible. <laughs> what, what's your process like to sort of take an idea, conceptualise it and then bring it to fruition is it is it something that happens quite organically or is it quite processed like quite methodically I think it's different for me I feel like there's so many different types of work that I make within my practice so whether it's a a suspended work or a wall mounted installation Mm -hmm. or freestanding installation there's all so many different um, initial 
sort of process of evolution, things that happen. So whether it's the actual drawing, for example, CAD programming, I do a lot mm -hmm. of quite crude, um, you know, mock-ups of, of different pods or interior structures for some of the wall-based installations. So I have to draw them, measure them up, give it to a carpenter, and then he, he'll, he'll then put it through CAD programming and, and construct the, the timber structure. So in that case, it's very analytical and very, um, you know, it's got to be exact. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, whereas for something that's a little bit more fluid, for example, uh, um, you know, one of my freestanding works, that could be simply a, uh, quite an expressive drawing mm -hmm. on a piece of paper or a napkin or, you know, whatever's lying around. Often there's bits of paper just flying around my studio with different scribbles and, and notes and, and things that I, I write down. I, I feel like I'm not as religious with my visual diaries as I used to be. And it's, it's funny, I feel like when, when you're constantly saying yes to projects and you know, it's deadline after deadline, I feel like, you know, it's, it's almost like I, I have to say to myself, I know what I'm doing. I can see it in my mind, just do it. Yeah. And often when I don't have those deadlines and that's something that I miss is just that playful, um, you know, it's sort of the brainstorming and, and the kind of, you know, playing with ideas and, um, you know, and constantly writing down and drawing, you know, for example, a piece like this is very organic and spontaneous. Um, there is no mapping out. There is no planning. Um, you know, each piece I might sit and make in one sitting. So I yeah. might say to myself, okay, I'm not going to get up until I finish it. And it might take three hours. It might take um, six hours. And, you know, often with these, they even though they look very meticulous and painstakingly detailed, um, for me, these are quite expressive um, compared to, to some of the other works that I do that, um, you know, have to be a little bit more regimented. But I think, yeah, there's just so many different ways. You know, often I, in the past, I've collaged. I've actually taken... Um, prints of previous works, cut them up and, and collaged and sort of um, pasted them on, on paper to, to think about new works. So sometimes old works influence new works or, mm. um, you yeah, know, so it's so many different different ways. Yeah. I really like that idea of, um, I mean, I need to be planned. Like my husband's probably rolling his eyes in the background going, because he's always saying, Ange, you need to be more organised. and you, you need, like, if you saw my desk right now, you'd go, oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of shit everywhere. <laughs> but I love that idea, like when you were talking about that piece, that they were just so free and organic and mm. they just they, they were just born and they were just you and you're in that moment and, yeah, what mm. would be will be. I love mm. that. I, love well, I want to ask you about work-life balance. Um, mm. That's something that, yeah, is constantly on my mind as well and um, mm. juggling that creative mm. side of life. I mean, for me, I think... I work in a creative field, but then I want to do art on the side, but then it's like family commitments and <laughs> all of those things. How do you how do you keep a fit and healthy lifestyle and see work as like do you see work as work or is art your life? Does that yeah, sense? it's a um it's a fine line. I think, you know, I sort of got to I think in my early twenties, mid twenties, I didn't have that work life balance. I think it takes time. It takes a lot of time of just experience and, and working out, okay, can I actually work for three months solid on a project and eat cans of tuna and just, you know, eat at my desk? And, and am, I, am I a robot? You know, no, I am not a robot. I am human and I need to sleep and I need to rest and I need to look after myself. And I think, you know, it's really those big projects and, and the huge deadlines and, things that I, I thrive on and I love and I love that excitement and that energy and, and working with, you know, a bunch, a team of people to produce a, a particular project. Um, but when I'm in it, I'm in it, yeah. you know, and often I think like maybe I'm not the best partner or maybe I'm not the best friend or, yeah. you know, and you come out of that and you think, well, you know, you, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. I feel like it's, it's certainly, it's, yeah, it's taken time for me to, to realize, okay, go and do yoga, go and swim, you know, do all those healthy, normal things, look after yourself. Because, you know, as the conversation before, it's about longevity as well. Yeah. And I think even in those quiet times, yes, you might not be always in the studio. You may not always be making, 
but it is those quiet times, whether it's, you know, a solo work, walk by yourself or a cup of coffee, you know, in the morning, just some quiet time where, you know, often those new ideas come in. So that's something that I'm very conscious of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Good advice. And I think, yeah, you do. Yeah. There's nothing worse than hitting a wall and then not being good for anybody. Is there? Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is it, is it nice to be in a position where you can be a little bit more picky and choosy of what you take on and what you don't take on now as a professional artist, as a commercial artist, you can be a little bit more choosy. Yeah. I think it's important to be selective. Um, like obviously when you're emerging and you're starting out, you know, say yes. By all means, say yes to everything. Um, but I think, you know, you get to a certain point where you think, hang on a second, is that where I see my work? And it's just making those little decisions, you know, on a, on a kind of sort of career level, I guess. You know, where do you, where's your trajectory? What, yeah. what platform is your audience? You know, where do you see the work? So for me it was, you know, there's been moments that I've had opportunities to exhibit in particular countries and I've thought I'm going to do this this is you know for example in New York but then I might have had a mentor or somebody tell me you know what don't do it and I think yeah, there's at the time you know there's been certain opportunities and things decisions made that yeah sort of years later I think that was the right choice by not saying yes to that you know and I think it's um you know having the the freedom and you know uh, very grateful for that to be able to choose but also um, yeah, just be a bit more specific and selective, which therefore it means that the work hopefully will be better for it as well, rather than extending, overextending yourself. Yeah. 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 For any fibre mixed media artists listening, in today's commercial artwork, so there's always been this thing or as far as long as I've been in sort of fibre textile art realm, there's been this, hmm, struggle maybe about you know valuing the art seeing fiber art as you know like a craft your work is extremely contemporary mm. and I love it it's fantastic but in today's like and you're a commercial you, you describe yourself as a commercial artist is that correct yeah, yeah I'd say yeah. yeah so in today's commercial art world how important is it to be contemporary so I'm Thinking like in terms of fiber art, textile art, how like to be a commercial artist, would you think, and it could be any any genre, any medium, is it important to be contemporary to be commercial? That's my question. Like just from your perspective, you know. Yeah, I think this is definitely rather fitting for, for our conversation right now because I feel like I place myself in that situation. I sit on the fence, you know, I'm this sort of yeah. split polar opposite where I've learned the traditional foundations of ceramics and I went to a, a traditional art school and I learned all of the foundations and I went and I studied uh, and I further pursued my study in Jing De Jeng and I worked with different master artisans because I wanted to take a traditional material, a traditional process and essentially turn it upside down. Everything that it has, it was steeped in history. I wanted to take it and reinvent it. I wanted to recontextualize the material. So for me, you know, I, I set out as a young artist wanting to see ceramics um, on a contemporary platform with my peers, which were painters and sculptors and, and installation-based artists. I wanted to see ceramics at the Museum of Contemporary Art. So for me, that, that was my um, essentially trajectory straight after art school where, you know, I, yeah, and, you know, it was something that, like I, I was doing things at art school that were pretty unusual and, mm. um, you know, unheard of in a, in a very set, you know, things have changed now and, and the guards have changed, you know, the, <laughs> um, yeah. at the school and things are different. But, you know, even though it's only 10 years, it's amazing what I've seen. And this conversation and this age old divide between craft and fine art, mm. you know, that no longer exists. And I think if you can right. take, if you can take a medium that has, you know, and is steeped in history and, and learn, learn everything you can about that material, about that process, about the technique and make it your own and reinvent it, that's contemporary. Like that's exciting. You know, and what happens from that or whichever way you can push that or, you know, that's your own language. That becomes your own narrative. 
and for me that's that's really about um you know creating contemporary art and creating unique individual art and you know and of course it's got a historic context because you've uh, and you know artists everybody borrows everything from each yeah. other and i think you know if you're able to to reinvent it um you know that's exciting and that's contemporary art in my mind yeah that's probably the best explanation of contemporary art that I've ever heard. So thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. Uh, it just, just makes so much sense when you say that, you know, like I've heard a lot of people say, you know, it's I go, oh, what's contemporary art, you know? Well, it's art that has meaning. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and then um, my beautiful neighbour said, I ask her the question, she's a fine artist, she's a painter, she was a, a, a potter as well, and I say, you know, Cherry, what does contemporary mean? And she says, well, it means of this time, Ange. And I go, okay, of this time. So I feel like I've been asking this question for, and I just, yeah, yeah, well done, bravo. <laughs> going back to art school, and I've got a couple of last questions, so if you don't mind, I know we've almost been going an hour, so I really appreciate your time. Um, talk to me, obviously you were pushing the boundaries very, very early on. What was it like that moment that David Walsh walked into your studio pretty much unannounced <laughs> and says, within four minutes, I'll have, I don't know, did he say I'll have, what did he say? <laughs> he, at, at the time, there was a, a friend who was a year below and she was a, a bit of a socialite. So she was uh, an ex-model that had been working in, in Hong Kong for some time and decided to leave the modelling behind and she wanted to become a curator um, so here she was, you know, she'd had this professional career and all of a sudden she was a, an art student at the National Art School. So it was really quite quite a funny thing. Um, anyway, she called me and she said, look, there's this guy, David Walsh. I had no idea who he was. Um, he's here for a funeral. We're about 20 minutes away from your studio. We're going to come by. And at that point, I, you know, I was pretty, pretty shy. You know, I was young. I was 20, 22. I like I said, my work was crude. It was unresolved. I'd never sold anything. I, you know, could barely talk about it. Um, mm. You know, I found it incredibly confronting anytime a professor would come in and want to have a conversation about what I was doing. Yeah. Um, so all those things all of a sudden, you know, hit me right there as he's looking at the work that was half finished on the wall. Uh, it was a major installation. I, I was halfway through the project and um, my friend had said to me, look, say something, say something, you know, talk about your work, talk it up. Um, and nothing, I couldn't, couldn't talk about it. So I think in that moment, it was, uh, it was interesting just to, that the work spoke for itself. You know, I didn't have to, um, you know, there was no art jargon that backed it up or anything, you know, it, it literally, he saw what he saw. And in that moment he turned around, um, and said, look, I'm interested in acquiring the entire collection. How much would you like? So in that, you know, that's sort of quite a, a strange sort of moment in any honours student's, um, you know, life or for that to happen. So uh, I said, look, I need the weekend <laughs> to think about oh, it. Good. Yeah, good. And then I came I back. To ask all my professors, I need to ask them. <laughs> yeah. I'm not answering you straight away because I'll regret it for the rest of my life. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> You'd be like, take it. It's yours. You have it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a beautiful thing. And I, you know, even looking back to that, I feel like, um, yeah, often it it might just take one person. I feel like prior to that, people perhaps didn't really take it seriously. Uh, you know, they were a bit unsure. I, I mentioned before that I came from quite a conservative family, so they, you know, perhaps didn't have the the initial support. Um, you know, wanting to pursue a career in the arts. So you know, all of a sudden, I feel like here I was, sort of, um, you know, chipping away and, and doing my thing, but. It, it's like it just took somebody to say, hang on a second, that's interesting. What is that? Um, so at that moment, you know, I'm incredibly fortunate. And um, his one of, um, you know, a huge influence was uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat when I was at high school. And the first exhibition of the work um, that he purchased was exhibited next to Jean-Michel. Uh, so that was a pretty sort of, you know, pivotal moment in my little brain at that point. <laughs> so, um, yeah, wow. very That's exciting. Mm. That's really, really, really exciting. 
A couple of last questions. I'm really sorry. They keep coming in my, into my brain, right? And mm. I had written this one down, but you mentioned it like how important is it to be able to communicate the concept of your pieces? So like when you're an art student and you're trying to develop your way and you're trying to find your voice and resolve, well, what are we actually, what am I actually doing here? Mm. How, how long did it take you to be able to, you know, because basically where this question came from is that I do a lot of, like I don't do a lot, but I do yeah. some research obviously on the people we interview yeah. and there's always these beautiful, because I can't say a lot because I don't spend weeks and weeks and weeks on it, but I spend a solid week on it. Yeah. How, like, and there's always these beautiful statements written about work about exhibition about and I was like oh you know everyone has their own language about their work so my question is do they teach that at art school or is it something you just have to learn on your own mm, or is it I feel like a bit of wisdom, you know? I feel like a bit of so I think they it depends on obviously what art school you go to if you were yeah. speaking Sydney um because that's obviously where I grew up but if you were to go to Sydney College of the Arts, they're definitely more conceptual, um, you know, less about the actual making of the work, then yes, integral, so important in that context. For me personally, I feel like coming from the ceramics department, I um, got let off the hook perhaps and didn't have to write so much within the ceramics department compared to painters, um, for example, but I feel like things have changed now. You know, I graduated um, several years ago now. So I think that it's definitely important, but I, you know, it's, I, I struggle, you know, I have moments where, for example, if I'm in the thick of making and I've, you know, I've, I've got deadlines here, there and everywhere, but I'm, I'm making solidly every day. And then a gallery contacts me and says, send me a half page statement about the work. Everything goes into disarray. No, I can't talk about it because I'm in it. I'm making it. Mm. Um, so I find that, you know, personally I need to step away from it. So perhaps, you know, at the end of, um, you know, once the work's completed, take some time away, come back um, and look at it objectively and be able, I, I, I do this weird thing where I try to write in third person um, yeah. about, my, about my work just so that I can remove myself and it becomes less personal. Yes. Um, because for me, I, I really want, I want my work to be universal. I don't want it to be, um, you know, relative. Yes, it's very much, um, you know, my narrative, and uh, but it's based on the human condition. Um, and, you know, the reference points uh, are worldly, I'd like to think so. So I'd, I'd like to think that it's, you know, there's a worldly context and uh, a lot of people can, can relate to that. Mm. Yeah, well, what I've read, what I've researched is just beautiful. I feel yeah. like you've just, yeah, you've nailed it and it's gorgeous. Oh, yeah. I just came up with another question as well. When you were in... <laughs> okay, fine. No, I warned you I was a bit of a dag, right? <laughs> <laughs> when you were in China and the, the ladies were gifting you the horns, did they want to steal some of your hair? Like, did they... Have you ever been tempted? Like, did they want to steal your... Like, use your hair in any of their headdresses? Like, did you have to leave any of it behind? Isn't it funny? It was less... I don't know, I guess... in more, all I'm, That's... Yeah, it's interesting to say because in all my experience of being in China, it's very much... You know, you're like a rock star. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got so, so much attention. It's unbelievable. And, you know, often sometimes welcomed attention, sometimes unwanted. But in this context, it wasn't about myself or you know I was with a, a dear Chinese friend of mine uh, it wasn't about us it was about them so I think you know in that m moment um, yeah for example I think I can't imagine you no know, that they'd want to take my hair and turn it into a headdress actually <laughs> I think there'd yeah. be some spiritual connotation around it they'd probably think it was yeah quite strange <laughs> yeah. yeah now my daughter is a beautiful artist. She's only 15 and mm. we're encouraged, like quite different to maybe the traditional side of parents. Are you hiding in the background, Summer? I asked her to come on live and ask you a question. Oh, yeah. oh please do. <laughs> yeah, well, but she was too shy. She can't, she can't, She doesn't want to, to be live. So I've, I've written down her question for her. I can see her. She's in the background with my husband, but she doesn't. I won't put her on live because, yeah. So, her, so she's thinking 
maybe about a career in art. She'd love to be able to travel somehow, work for travel, travel for work. Um, but she also likes her solitary time, um, you know, She and she's a maker, but she likes all different types of making. So her question to you was, how do you know when to specialise in just one thing? I'm worried I'll get bored. Okay, that's interesting. So I, I feel like there's so many different types of artists and there's the artist that has just bursts of energy and, and so many ideas and constantly bounces between, between different mediums, different projects, and that's a wonderful thing. And I think that, you know, some, some people have that kind of personality and can time manage and, um, you know, are able to, to be a powerhouse in that kind of environment. Personally, I couldn't do that. I had to pick a medium and I chose to master that in my way to master that medium. So I think if you are to choose a form, this is just my opinion, mm -hmm. to choose a form and really devote time to that and push it and challenge it. And like I said before, if it's a traditional medium that you're using, turn it upside down. Uh, turn it on its head, you know, show people that you're you're reinventing uh, and making new ways of making. And by doing that, you stand out and you're, you're different. And in doing that, uh, people see that, whether it's in the art world, a, a collector or a curator or uh, an events manager, somebody putting together a festival or, uh, you know, whether it's music or, you know, it's, I think, really finding your forte and art school is wonderful for that because you go with the intention of pursuing a particular medium. I went to pursue photography and I got completely sidetracked by ceramics. So I think, you know, in, in that kind of environment, you're exposed to all these things that you've never touched before. Uh, and all of a sudden you've got this, this visual language uh, and ability to express yourself in mediums, you know, previously unheard of. So I think, you know, until you're in that environment and you really find, um, you know, your artistic voice, you, you don't know just yet, no. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> Summer, can you give me a nod and, and let me know if that was helpful? She's, oh, she's going like this in the background, thumbs up. She won't even put her head up in case I flick her on the screen. So. <laughs> That was really, really beautiful. Jazz, mm. I have put my name down to come to Milton and do one of your amazing, well, oh, like, amazing. Oh, great. Yeah, what, really what can students expect by coming to Milton and hanging out with you for a weekend? What can we oh, do? What can so, we um, well, we, I think I've we've got one workshop that's definitely going ahead. That's the 18th and 19th of December, but I believe there's probably only a couple of spots left. Um, now that you've jumped in and, and, and taken one of I those got spots. First great. Table, sorry. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> but um, fortunately, and obviously lockdown is pending, uh, yeah. the plan is the weekend previous to that, which would be the 11th and 12th, I believe. Yeah. Just the, the weekend before, um, we'll be opening up a, a new slot as well. So it's a pretty amazing experience. It's something that I'm not a qualified teacher. Uh, I didn't study teaching, but I really enjoy it. And I find that um, I invite people into my home, uh, into my studio. Um, we eat from the garden. We eat locally sourced vegetarian feast that Mira Whale, who's a Sydney-based artist, and uh, she's also been held, um, uh, exhibited in the Archibald seven years going or something ridiculous. Yeah, she's coming up for a win, no doubt. Yes. Yes. <laughs> she, does all the, she does all the cooking. Um, we, we make uh, sort of a lot of the, the objects that we're making uh, reference the natural environment. Um, you know, I show a plentitude of hand form techniques of uh, all my techniques, essentially, of what I've, what I've uh, taught myself. And a lot of the girls that I work with are constantly saying, don't give away so much. You give away your secrets. But for me, it's, I, it, that brings me so much joy. And I love it. And I, like I say, I, I teach essentially I create a platform for people to express themselves. So it's a nurturing, safe environment. It's fun. Um, it's engaging. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of art history speak, uh, contemporary artists uh, uh, are mentioned. 
as well as lots of making and, and good food and good company. Um, so generally it attracts some really interesting people from all walks and not just uh, makers, you know, there's, yes. there's all sorts of, um, you know, people in, in the corporate world as, as well as mm. teachers, high school teachers. So it attracts a really, um, you know, vast array of people, which is, yeah, so much fun. Yeah, yeah. And there's beautiful, we've put a link up to your website. Um, this is what you can expect, everybody. This is a beautiful, this is a picture of your studio on the left and your yeah. kiln. I, I was going to call it a kiln cupboard. Kiln shed. <laughs> a little kiln shed, that's what I call it. <laughs> the kiln shed, but it just looks, it just looks pristine and beautiful. And if you jump onto Jazz's website and go into like the gallery, se- or the workshops and then the gallery section, there's yeah. beautiful, like there's so many beautiful images and photos and on your Facebook pages, videos of... Yeah, it's probably a good idea to, to follow the, the yeah. Art House Melton Facebook page and uh, yeah. just keep up to date if you're interested. And I think in the future, you know, we'll probably do smaller smaller workshops as well. And um, I've been pushed into doing Zoom sessions, but I'm not sure how to, how to work that one out yet. But <laughs> let's see how oh, we go. Okay. <laughs> well, let me know. You let me know if you want to do an online course. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Thank okay. yeah. you. Well, could yeah. film it beautifully. Yeah, oh. talk to Harriet. She was, yeah, she came up. Oh, I did see snippets of that. That was, yeah, that was yeah, exquisite. Yeah, it was beautiful. Cool. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I saw Minka, Minka on one of your students. I was like, oh, that's Minka Gillian. Like, she came to do one of your workshops as well. Oh, she's like, yeah, yeah, she's a two times. She's been twice now to the workshops. Mm-hmm. Yeah, re- <laughs> Re- what is it? Recurring offender. <laughs> loves it. Absolutely loves it. No, that's great. And that's the yeah. thing. I've made such wonderful friends, and it's it's becoming a community, yeah. um, a little tight knit community down yeah. here. So, no, I look forward to sharing with you guys. And thanks so much for yeah um, being on tonight. Oh, been- no problem at all. And good luck with your solo exhibition that's currently going at the moment with um, Dominic Mersch Gallery. Yeah. In- yes, yeah, so that's in Sydney at the moment. Yeah, it just these were the in, uh, images that we were showing here. They're just it just looks like a stunning space, and I hope that people can get there live and see it. I just yeah, it just looks incredible. And congratulations! I hear that you know some pieces are selling it despite lockdown, and it's just yeah, it's fantastic to know that the arts will survive no matter what. Oh, exactly. No, it's good to times. Thank you, Anne. No, no worries. It. I'm going to play a little video to exit. Hang on the line and I'll say goodbye to you afterwards as well. It sometimes yeah. feels a bit weird if we just cut it off. <laughs> um, and I'll just invite everyone who's watching, please write a comment and thank Jazz very much for her time and her beautiful insights tonight. It's been, yeah, such a pleasure to speak to such a professional, well-versed, beautiful artist. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, what a pleasure. <laughs> thank you.